It ain't the left side or the right side. Then it must be the fin side. Inside. It ain't the left side or the right side. Thank you, Solo D. Welcome to another episode of On the Fin Side here with Kat and Paul Pickin. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, and on iHeartRadio. Paul, before we get into the game here, I, I think we'd be remiss to not mention Dolphins offensive line coach Chris Furster caught doing uh, what appears to be a line of cocaine on his desk and videotaping it. So your thoughts? Well, let's, let's just, I think it was three lines, and I think he was talking to oh, sorry, you're right. allegedly a hooker about where he wanted to do those lines off of as he recorded himself doing all this crap. I know there's been other indiscretions he's been caught doing with other organizations in the past, and I know we'll leave it at that. You know, hey, at least, you know, we know that uh, our offensive line coach had a lot of energy at times, so there's a reason for that. I'm kind of remorseful that Miami blocked him interviewing for the offensive coordinator job with, with the Rams this off season because, you know, Miami won. Their defense looked good, even if their offense looked crap at times. And now we've got to sit here instead of reveling in a win, talking about, you know, our offensive line coach slash run game coordinator and all the blow and hookers he's doing. So <laughs> yeah, what a freaking joke. What a joke. I mean, good God. I mean, Gase's press conference was the most uncomfortable thing I've watched in a long time. Well, what what do you say after that? I mean, what was funny about it is on Twitter they're talking about the Dolphins uh, are, are waiting to see. What, what What is the waiting to see? He's basically on camera doing lines of cocaine saying, hi, I'm Chris Furster. If, if there was a, like a, a PSA for cocaine, then uh, that would have been it. So – Unbelievable. Yeah, but God, I mean, and, and thank God he went ahead and resigned before they had to put his uncomfortable ass up on the podium. I mean, I know he's obviously comfortable, very comfortable in front of a camera, given the, what we saw in the video. But yeah, I think it's it's time for him to part ways, and he's probably going to struggle to find a, a job in the NFL at this point, being a, a mediocre coach who's already had indiscretions, and now this right before a meeting, no less. Yeah. And I felt bad for Jim Turner when he got fired after the whole quote unquote bully gate scandal and, you know, where he gave his players blow up dolls, which was in poor taste, but this is something completely different. So yeah, it does take away from the Dolphins victory over the Titans on Sunday, 16 to 10, definitely an ugly game, not for the faint of heart, but it was a great defensive performance by the Miami Dolphins really from from defensive line to linebacker to defensive back. I mean, I think we could, if we're just grading offense and defense, I think we can make that pretty easy. Offense gets an F and the defense gets an A. So let's move right on to the grades, Paul. Uh, Jay Cutler, 12 for 26, 92 yards, touchdown and an interception. Uh, with 10 minutes left in the third quarter, Jay Cutler had thrown for 18 yards in the day. I mean, is he ever going to turn this around? And how do you grade his performance? Uh, I miss David Fail still. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it now, and I'm going to say it again, and I'm going to say it again until Cutler wakes the hell up. I mean, I don't think Cutler's the answer. I don't think Matt Moore's the answer. David Fails is the closest thing we've had to an answer since Tannehill rolled right and fell down. So, yeah, this is a rough thing given the weapons that Miami has on offense, given the fact that. You know, they haven't been able to get their run game established because why not? Why would they have to respect the passing game in this instance? So it's rough. It's really rough. And if I'm Graydon Cutler, he he did a little at the end, but solid D minus yet again. I'll stay with that, too. It's hard for me to grade it higher than that. I mean, I will give the Dolphins credit for one drive in the fourth quarter that put them up 16 to 10 where he had a a nice throw to Jarvis Landry for the touchdown. But other than that, man, oh, man. I mean, I I can't get over his feet. I mean, he drops back, and when he sees the slightest bit of pressure, shuffles his feet and just dumps the ball off to the first person that he sees. Not good enough. So the Dolphins are going to – it really is what it is at this point. I, I think Matt Moore right now would be a substantial upgrade at the quarterback position. We'll see if it actually happens. Jay Ajayi, 
an uncharacteristic fumble here. I, I think it's his first lost fumble since his rookie year. I, I could be mistaken on that, but he's had 300-something carries without a fumble. Given that, I'm willing to let that one go, considering that it didn't cost the Dolphins the game. So I really thought in the fourth quarter, Ajaye took the team on his back and, and took him to victory. But overall, 25 carries, 77 yards, no touchdowns and a fumble. I mean, still still not all that great in terms of yards per carry, but he did have a huge fourth quarter there. Damian Williams also had a few nice plays. I'm going to go with a C-plus for the running back spot, Paul. Yeah, for me, I, I'm I'm with you there. I was going to exact, use that exact phrase, took the team on his back, because as far as the offense goes, he really did. And this is easily a grade that some folks may look at some of the stat lines and, and and think I'm crazy, but if you watch the game, watch what he meant to this team as the game wore on, I'm going to go with a B-plus here, uh, and I think it's it's finally starting to turn the corner for this kid. I'm glad Ajayi got a little bit of running room here. The run blocking was a little bit better, so hopefully the offensive line, without Chris Furster's uh, fantastic leadership skills, hopefully they continue to, 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 to continue opening holes for them. The receiver unit, Devontae Parker, catches a pass for six yards, leaves the game, doesn't return. Wide receiver unit really struggled after that ball. They did. But I'm not sure how much of that's on them. You know, we look back at what we said about Jay Cutler, and we've had guys flying open and just not being seen, let alone thrown at. So uh, receivers such a struggle to grade. I think Julius Thomas sucks still, but – he did have a pretty impressive catch and run after the catch in this game for the first time, in, in my opinion, anyway. So it's a tough one to grade. I, I've got to go smack dab in the middle and go with a C bordering on a C plus, mainly because I don't think a lot of the receiver struggles are their fault. Uh, Kenny Stills continues to look strong to me, even if he's not being utilized. He continues to, to fly open down the field. He continues to, to make those tough catches when his number is called. He's just not being utilized. Uh, Jakeem Grant almost came away with one of the most beautiful passes ever and, or receptions ever for a touchdown, but unfortunately one of the defenders just managed to rip it away at the last second. So, you know, it, it's, I wish they'd use him a little bit more. And so for me, yeah, right in the middle of the road. Typically I give the receivers a, more of a pass. You know, you, you look at last game and the game before, we were talking about Kenny Stills getting open deep and just Jay Cutler not seeing them. But I saw a different receiver unit in this game. Once Parker went down, they struggled to separate all game long. I mean, Julius Thomas, yeah, he did have a catch for one catch that was in the game at the end of the game, and it was big, but that was the only catch of the game. And on a third and one, Jay Cutler, one of the better throws, passes he's made all year, Julius Thomas uh, lets the ball – hit him right right between the eight and the nine. Um, Kenny Stills had a drop. Jarvis Landry had two drops. So I, I didn't quite see the separation here. Definitely a disappointing game. And, and it started to show a little bit how this receiver unit could look when Devontae Parker's not there to, to take the top off the defense and make plays in traffic. So they get a D from me. Offensive line played a little bit better. And I'll tell you what, I, I really think one guy – that might actually be starting quality on the interior of this, of this line is Anthony Steen. I, I think he's actually even a better center than he is a left guard, but he played pretty well in this game. But Mike Pouncey continues to be shoved back. Jermon Bushrod continues to be shoved back. Juwan James, I thought, let up way too many pressures, which is very unlike him. Tunzel, I thought, played an okay game here, but Cutler was under quite a bit of pressure. The holes weren't there enough. When you look at the running backs having three yards of carry, so for me the the offensive line is smack dab in the middle of the seat. I'm going to go with the as well for a lot of the reasons that you mentioned. Uh, I'm with you on Steen, and I, I saw I saw uh, Tunsil and Juwan James played okay in this game. I know Tunsil let it let it sack get by, but I mean they started opening running lanes up as the game wore on. They started pushing a little bit more which was a good thing to see. It was a very good positive step in the right direction. And the most hilarious thing to me is, is I know we've talked in previous weeks about Cutler kind of ducking 
tucking the ball away and, like, looking to get sacked. And there was a play in this game where Cutler kind of did that right off the rip. And, you know, he ducked to the left, he ducked to the right, just staring at the ground, like, waiting to get sacked, and then finally realized he wasn't about to and kind of pulled up and threw the ball like, uh, oh, okay, uh, crap, I didn't plan for this. I guess I'll throw it now. So I can't fully fault the offensive line as far as the sacks go. I mean, there's there's going to be a handful here and there. But for me, right in the middle of, of the pack with a C, and, and there were signs of improvement from the O-line in this game. I don't put it on their shoulders why the offense looked abysmal. Moving on to the defensive side of the ball, uh, I can't remember a time where the Dolphins had such a dominant defensive performance. And when you look at the end of the first of the first quarter, the Dolphins had a ten to nothing lead that had nothing to do with the offense. I mean, uh, Kiko Alonso forces a has a forced fumble on Matt Castle that later gets called a touchdown, returned by Rashad Jones, and Devin Gotcha strips. DeMarco Murray and gives the Dolphins a first down right there inside of the 42 yard line that eventually turns into a field goal. So there's 10 points right there, but man, oh man, they're flying all over the field, but let's look at the defensive line. Andre branch, two sacks. Davin Gotcha continues to look like a consummate professional. Sue had a sack. Cameron Wake had a sack, six sacks overall for the defense here. But I think the one play that really for the first time all year, had me up and cheering and really, really feeling something. Charles Harris flies off the edge with three minutes left, takes down Matt Castle. Beautiful pass rush move out there. So great job there. I mean, overall, just a dominant defensive performance against a really good Titans offensive line. They get an A all day for me. This defensive line made the, the Titans offensive line look like a bunch of freaking preschoolers. It was amazing watching that. It really set the tone for everybody behind them in this game. I mean, good God, they they were leaving Castle bloody and battered. And, you know, they, they sent him into the concussion protocol tent. Uh, actually, I think Kiko did that. But still, I mean, it's just they were all over to Marco Murray. They were all over everyone on this on this Titans offense, and really the, the the back end of the defense didn't have to cover for a long time. They beat the living hell out of out of out of the Titans right there up front in the trenches. I'm I'm going to give out I believe my first A plus of the year here because you can't get much better than what they did in this game. I've got to say, you see, I'm going to save my A pluses. I I mean, because if I give someone an A plus, I I have a feeling like. If Jay Ajayi busts out a 350-yard game, then I have nowhere else to go. And then we're going to start going into A++. and a. <laughs> No, but they're, they're definitely deserving of an A+. there. But the linebacker core, I, I mean, I'm tempted to give them an A, an a+ right there. Kiko Alonso and Lawrence Timmons. I don't think I've seen a better game from a Dolphins line, linebacker group than the Zach Thomas days. I mean, Kiko Alonso just flying all over the field. He had that forced fumble, and then on the next drive, Delaney Walker catches a pass for a first down, and Kiko sticks his fist out there and punches it right out. I mean, phenomenal defensive performance. And DeMarco Murray and Derrick Henry, not much success when they've had success all year. Lawrence Timmons has been sensational in these two games since his return. He's come back more motivated than ever. And Ray Maluga even gets in there and sticks his nose in there on run defense. So I give this unit an A, too. Yeah, as far as the linebackers go, I mean, God, we finally looked like we really had three solid linebackers. I know I've talked enough trash about Ray Maluga leading up to now. I know you have, too, and the fact that he finally got his fat ass in shape is really a phenomenal thing to see. I mean, I think he played 50-plus percent uh, of of the defensive snaps here, which, which tells you a lot in this game. Lawrence Timmons, you know what, for me, we're two weeks into the Timmons experiment. All is forgiven at this point. He, he's, he's shown himself as a leader out there. His teammates still seem to love him, and he's making plays all over the field. And this, this was probably the, the best game from start to finish I've seen out of Kiko Alonso. I'm going with an A. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is something. And, and Ray Maluga, you know, we, he's still fat. We can still make jokes about that. But he was fat in a productive way. He was good on run defense. And another note about the linebacker unit, and good news for him, uh, Neville Hewitt was actually re-signed to the Dolphins practice squad. He's a, he's somebody that might be effective a little bit here 
later in the year if the Dolphins still do need a linebacker. So the unit's kind of picking up there. So let's move on to the defensive backs. Uh, you know, Cordrea Tankersley and uh, Xavier Howard hold the Titans to just a couple of catches, I think combined six catches for 70 yards. You know, a lot of that has to do with Matt Castle, but, you know, they started looking like that young cornerback tandem of the future here. And as far as I'm concerned, Byron Maxwell can pack his bags right now. Uh, looking at, at the other defensive backs, Rashad Jones is starting to look like the Rashad Jones bold. He started showing glimpses of that against the Saints last week, but he was flying all over the field. He just makes the defense so much faster. It's going to be fun to watch this the, the safety group when T.J. McDonald returns here a little bit later in the year. Not surprisingly, the only player that, that stuck out for a bad reason, number 29, Nate Allen. But I, I can't let that take away from an overall really good defensive performance uh, from the secondary. I'm going to give him an A-. minus. Xavier Howard helped set the tone there, too. When he flew up and body-checked DeMarco Murray when he looked like he might turn the corner there, oh, my God, that was amazing. It was just, I mean, you, you hear good old JR from the WWF yelling, you know, he killed him. He straight killed him. But, no, <laughs> I mean, it, how, how great is it that, we're saying Rashad Jones is starting to look like Rashad Jones and not even fully back to looking like him. And he was the top rated safety in the NFL by pro football focus this week. I mean, holy crap. I mean, the ceiling for this guy is, is insane. And every time I get upset with Nate Allen, I, I, I do have a little mantra that I say to myself where it's like, you know what? It's still better than Bakari Rambo. It is still better than Bakari Rambo. So, Believe it or not, it's it's an upgrade at the safety position next to Rashad Jones this year, even with, you know, the craptastic Nate Allen out there. And like you said, he's only out there for a few more weeks. T.J. McDonald's going to take over. And then I really think that's when we're going to see the defense get even more special. I'm going with an A yet again because I thought the defense was, was lights out. And, I mean, it's surprising. Uh, defense as a whole, I know you talked earlier about the defense being an A. The defense is really top 10, top five in a lot of categories around the NFL statistics. Really it's impressive what they've been able to do, especially given the fact that Miami's offense has been so bad. It, I, the word that comes to mind with the Dolphins' defense really over the last two games is discipline. I think they've looked very disciplined since Lawrence Timmons entered the lineup. And I give a lot of that credit to Davin Gotcha too. I mean, Jordan Phillips, even though he played well in the first game before he got hurt, one observation I continue to make week after week, and we continue to talk about is he was the guy that always seemed to be out of his gap. I didn't see Gotcha as that guy that was that's out of his gap. And Vincent Taylor, too, when he gets in for 10 to 15 snaps a game, you know, he's starting to look good. So the, the Dolphins could, uh, you know, continue to build up that defense. And and a shout-out, too, as well to Bobby McCain, who I thought had a really good game there in the slot. You know, uh, I, I don't see any, you know, the, the really the poor performers here are, By, are Byron Maxwell, Nate Allen, and Ultron Verna this year. So if we, you're going to have some poor performers in the secondary, I'm glad that it's it's those veterans instead of those young guys, not to mention the Dolphins do get Tony Lippett back next year. Paul, uh, to round things out, your thoughts on the special teams. I thought Matt Hawk really was one one of the more valuable players on the team, uh, which says a lot given the fact that you know we did have two of the top rated players at any at their positions in this game in, in Kiko Alonso and Rashad Jones. But Matt Hawk proved to be very critical in terms of flipping field position over and over again throughout this game. I mean, he kicked the living donkey snot out of the ball. And the only thing that really lowers the grade here is I like Cody Parkey a lot, but he seems to get worse as he gets closer, as we've seen by him missing his second extra point. And let's face it, the guy hasn't had a lot of opportunities to kick extra points this year. So really, he needs to get that on track because Miami's got to be able to rely on their kicker to make an extra point reliably. So for me, I still got to go with an A-. I thought the coverage units were good. I didn't have a problem with, with some of the attempted returns that some people did have an issue with, given the struggles the offense had. Hey, you know what? Let the returner try to make something happen, even if it seems a little goofy. So, yeah, for me, we're going to go with that. Yeah, it's weird with Parky because, I mean, 
what is he, six of his last six from 50-plus, and he's one of his last three on extra points? I mean, that, that's downright astounding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Matt, Matt Hawk as well, had, he – he had one bad punt early in the game, but um, then he recovered very nicely. I mean, Brett Kern on the other side for the Titans was was just phenomenal. But Jakeem Grant, it seems like every time I've got some sort of problem with him. And part of it, too, is is I, I just love Jarvis Landry as a punt returner. I don't care if he gets hit a few extra times. You, you, you see the returns that he made. What I love about him is just what I loved about Wes Welker when he was here punt returning, is he would catch the ball, and if, if there are three yards to get, he gets seven. If there are five yards to get, he gets ten. That's what I like about him. I hope they keep him there on punt returns, even though it's going to put some extra hits on his body. So, Paul, who is your player of the game here? For me, it's got to be Rashad Jones. As good as that defensive front was, his wherewithal to pick that ball up, realize the whistle hadn't been blown, and run it all the way to the end zone. I mean, the fact that he was flying all over the field, making plays all over the field, whether it was in run support, whether it was pass defense, uh, he just made things happen in this game and really helped set the tone for that entire defense. And, yeah, it, it's easily, easily player of the game in this one for me. There are a lot of players to choose from here. I mean, it's it's hard to believe that you've got someone like Andre Branch who had two sacks. Easily it could have been more, and, and he's not even in my top three for consideration. I've got to go with Kiko Alonso. Um, Lawrence Timmons is close on that, but Kiko was an absolute monster in this game. And, you know, if he doesn't force that, uh, that fumble that Rashad Jones picks up and runs to the end zone, and then the following drive, doesn't punch out that ball from Delaney Walker. I mean, it's a completely different looking first quarter and the Dolphins may end up probably end up dropping this game to the Titans. So I'm going to give it to Kiko Alonso. How about your go to the game? And you can't say Adam Gase. Well, I'm going to say Adam Gase because even if I have to give somebody else an addition to that, because this craptastic offense, he continues to go with the fact that, you know, some of these personnel decisions, uh, were his over there, and and how sissified the play calling is. It's just it, it's he's got to be in the, in the conversation even if I can't officially name him here, because uh, for me it, it's just disgusting. I'm gonna go with Jay Cutler though if I have to list a player. It, it's that stupid stupid crap that I keep seeing from this kid where. He does that, like, duck and pretend he's getting sacked thing until he gets sacked on occasion or, as we saw in this game, does it for three or four seconds and realizes that there's nobody touching him and finally gives up and throws the ball. Uh, the decision-making, the field of vision, uh, so many different things. It, it, you know, Jay Cutler was supposed to be a don't-care gunslinger, I'm going to chuck it type of quarterback. And... God, he's been such an ultra-conservative sissy of a quarterback at this point that it's just absolutely disturbing to me. He, he's got to, he's got to come out of that for Miami to really go anywhere this year. Yeah, Gase and Cutler, they're definitely tied in the hip and for all the wrong reasons. I mean, it was Gase's choice. Don't, don't make any mistake about it for him that Jay Cutler is in the building. And the whole appeal is that it was supposed to be a quick transition. I mean, this is... I mean, forget – this is not a struggling offense. This is an offense that had 18 yards passing against a poor secondary halfway through a third quarter of a close game. I mean, it's beyond pathetic at this point. So, you know, it could be Gase. It could be Cutler uh, for me. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with Jakeem Grant offensively for, for a couple of reasons. One is he very easily could have fumbled one of those punt returns where he, he booked up – and caught and caught the punt return. There was another one, too, where he he caught the ball. He could have had some room, and he fell down. And then late in the game, Jakeem Grant has his moment to shine at wide receiver. Yeah, it's it's not an easy catch to make in the end zone, but he could have made it. And and that and that that's a ball that you got to come down with if you're going to be viewed seriously. And I I just don't see a lot of a lot of promise. I, I see the speed, but it, it just seems like for every one one play he does well, he makes four mistakes out there. Where is Leontay Carew these days is the question. 
But anyway, Paul, a lot more good than bad when looking at the team. Granted, all the good was always defensively. All of the bad uh, was on offense. It seems to be a common theme here from week to week. Any other thoughts on the Dolphins' win over the Titans? Not really. It's, it's I'm curious to see, and, and, and as we find out, I know we'll keep folks posted, who Miami fills into the role of offensive line coach and run game coordinator. But, no, it's really – we need to see Gase start calling plays with some balls. We need to see Jay Cutler out there playing with some balls because that is where Miami's season will go. It, it's only going to go as far as those two manage to figure out how to take it. And right now, two and two, a win feels good, but they're not going to be able to break away here unless they're able to grow a pair. And right now, they don't appear to, to, to have anything down there. Absolutely. And that will do it for our wrap-up of the Titans-Dolphins matchup. The Dolphins can get lucky next week against Atlanta. Then they've got two winnable games against the Jets and the Ravens after that. It's going to be a tough task. But Paul and I will be here to break that down, just as we are every week. Follow us on Facebook, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, and iHeartRadio. So if it's not on the right side, if it's not on the left side, it is on the same side. Solo D, take us home. It ain't the left side or the right side. And it must be the fin side. Big side. It ain't the left side, left side or the right, right side. side. And it must be the fin side. Look, listen, Dolphins fans across the land all tuning in to see what Brian Cat and Paul about to